Rebecca Adams here with Free to Soar, and I have my wonderful co-host Becky Vermeer with me again today. Hello. Now, when Becky and I were on last time, we were talking about emotional abuse and we were using the abuse inventory that they use at the Crisis Center of Taney County, where Becky is the executive director and has been for almost 25 years. She is a wealth of knowledge and information. So we weren't done talking about emotional abuse. And I, Becky, I know you had some great ideas. You want to pick up from that point and uh, just run with it where you wanted to sure. go? I mean, not only were we not done with emotional abuse, we barely scratched the surface, to be honest with you. And so um, as far as getting into the specific ins and outs of what does emotional abuse look like, we didn't really do that, honestly. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like we should probably just jump into that mm -hmm. um, and go with it. So a couple of things that I always like to point out when we're talking about this particular topic, I tend to be in my day-to-day -day life a storyteller. And it seems to me that the way that you can really make an impact on someone is when you just share your story. Case in point, when you wrote your book, you taking the time to share your story and free to store, free to store makes an impact on a person when they read that and they can relate to your journey and how you were able to free yourself from that abusive situation. And so before we get started on talking about emotional abuse, I want to make sure that we always set the parameter when we talk about domestic violence and tactics of abusers, that when you're talking about emotional abuse, again, the things that are done that are considered to be emotionally abusive are done with a particular intent and purpose in mind. And the intent and purpose is to maintain power and control over the victim. Again, I can't say it enough times, every single one of us is guilty of bad behavior from time to time. And so you may read some of these examples of emotional abuse and think to yourself, oh my gosh, I think I'm an abuser. If that's the case, then I want you to question yourself. Was my intent and purpose to maintain power and control over someone, or did I make a bad choice in a bad moment when I was having a bad day? And there is a big difference. And so we always need to keep that in the forefront of our, of our minds when we're talking about those things. So... I know I'm redundant on that, but I really do like to lay the parameters on that when we talk about these topics. What I would like to do now is just tell some stories of people who I have spoken to who have experienced this, and this is their tale. I'm going to tell it. So there was a woman that we had staying in our shelter that the situation that she was in, she was so much the object of her abuser's power and control that she literally couldn't leave the house without permission. He, he was a he, had her that controlled in that situation. And so she was one of the very first people that I ever worked with at the crisis center. And so you're talking again, 25 years ago, but it was very eye opening to me as I saw not only the elements of physical abuse come into play, but the elements of emotional abuse as well. And so in her particular, well, let me step back. One of my assignments for the day, the first day that I met her was she needed some food. And the crisis center has always made sure that people staying with us have food. This was so long ago that we actually used motel placement as our chief means of shelter. And so we even had to be selective about what kind of food we could provide for our, our residents because they didn't have a kitchen at their um, leisure. So anyway, I take this person in to go grocery shopping. And when we walked through the front door, she said, why are we here? And I said, we're here because you need some food and I wanna make sure that you can feed yourself. And she said, well, what am I supposed to buy? And I said, I would hope that you would buy whatever kind of food you would enjoy eating. What, what do you like to eat? And she, she hung her head and she started to cry right there in the grocery store. And she said, I have absolutely no idea what I like to eat. And I said, okay. I said, I'll tell you what let's do. Let's just start walking up and down the aisles of the store. And if you see something that you think you might like to eat, we'll put that in the cart. And she said, okay. And so we walked up and down every single aisle of the grocery store. When we got to the end of the store, literally there were like four items in the cart. And I said, I'm glad that you were able to pick out those four items, but really what we need to do is get you enough food for at least a week. So how about we walk back through the aisles again and you pour more things in? So we finally made it through the process and we went back out to my vehicle and she said, I have to tell you something. And I said, okay. 
So in her home with her abuser, going to the grocery store was an incredibly traumatic experience for her. And it, it wraps several of these different examples of emotional abuse into it that you talked about in our prior episode. Now, remember, this was 25 years ago. So when she was sent to the grocery store 25 years ago, she was sent to the grocery store with two quarters and a blank check. The first quarter she was expected to use when she got to the grocery store because there was a payphone outside the store and she was expected to call her abuser and let her know that she had made it to the store. There was a specific time period that she was allowed to spend in the grocery store, and then the blank check that she was given, she had a specific dollar amount that she was allowed to spend. She was not allowed to go over that dollar amount. Then the second quarter she was to use when she got done with her grocery shopping to call her abuser and let her know that she was on the way home. So here's where the trouble comes in. He told her what to buy. He had an idea of what he thought prices were. If prices changed in any way and she spent more than she was allowed to spend at the grocery store, she was physically abused when she got home. He knew how long it took to go to the grocery store. He knew how long it took to buy that amount of food. And he knew how long it took to get home from the store. If she fell out of those parameters in any way, she was physically abused when she got home. With the assumption, for example, if she got home 20 minutes later than she was supposed to get home, there was no understanding for there was a car accident or there was a some holdup in traffic or what, whatever it was. I ran into a friend in the parking lot and I wanted to say hello. What she was accused of is because you were gone longer than you were supposed to, you were cheating on me. I know you were having an affair. And so, you know, we talk about that element of emotional abuse. We talk about that controlling intense jealousy. If she thought of that parameter in any way, it was abundantly clear to her abuser that she was having an affair. And so is it any wonder then going to the grocery store traumatized her? And so, you know, I was a month old in my advocacy and had never experienced something like that before. But then I was able to understand there are so many elements of abuse going on in this person's relationship. Not only was she physically abused regularly, the emotional abuse happened on a daily basis. And again, when you talk about the emotional abuse, there's one of the things that you read, and I'm going to read it from the list. Um, falls and checks up on you, questions every expense, doesn't allow you to spend money. She was told what she could buy at the store. And so the day that I took her and said, let's get you something to eat, it never even dawned on me as a new advocate. She doesn't know what she wants to eat. So she'd been in that relationship. It was a 20 plus year relationship. And so for that length of time, she had absolutely no idea. And so, you know, we talked about in the earlier episode, the scars left by the emotional abuse. Over time, as she spent time at the crisis center, we were able to have a little bit more successful shopping trips, I'll say. But were they stellar? Were they normal, so to speak? No, because it was still a painful process for her. So again, I mean, that's just telling you, at the hand of your abuser, she'd been stripped of everything, including right down to, what do you like to eat? If you ask me at any given moment, what do I want to eat? Pretty sure I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but in that scenario, again, that type of, that, that type of power and control. And you handled it so beautifully because you stayed calm and you said, well, let's just start walking up and down the aisles. Beautiful way to handle that. Thank you. Yeah. And then when there were only four items left, well, let's go back through again. You stayed calm, you stayed kind and caring, which you are. And that's, that's beautiful the way you handled that. I cannot imagine the trauma. Now, I, I do know that it's traumatic for me to go shopping. Uh -huh. Even if I'm just walking in to get some non-food items, you know, some nail files, shampoo, whatever. Right. Um, it's, I still have to, and I'm not over this yet, and it's been almost 20 years, but I'm, I still find myself tense. And because uh, I had to, I had to watch every single penny. I was feeding a family of five on twenty dollars a week for a while. Wow! 
because that's all that was left over. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> it's been tough, you know, and, and so I still find myself in that, in a similar mindset of what uh, your client, your former client went through. I, I can't imagine though. That's just, that's awful. So that's the thing about emotional abuse when we talk about it again, and I've said it already, and I'm going to say it again. It's those scars. Those are the scars that no one sees. And so just in, in what you just said yourself, when you walk into a grocery store, nobody thinks anything about it. They don't see the scars that you're carrying when you go in there. And that's one of the hardest things to, to remove yourself from. You can physically be removed from your abuser. But here's the thing about abusive relationships. Abusive relationships truly start in a person's mind as loving, committed relationships. And so the challenge that a victim has leaving that abusive relationship is it started as loving, in their minds anyway, because they believe the person who said, I love you and I'm going to care for you. And so just because you find out today, this may not be the best relationship for me to be in, doesn't mean you just turn off love. Love isn't like a light switch that we turn on and we turn off. And so again, the power, the emotional power that that person has over the victim is exponential. Like it's, it, it just grows and it grows because again, there's that, that foundation, at least in the victim's mind, that's the loving, loving relationship. Mm -hmm. And so then not only do you have to process all of the things that you're experiencing, you have to try to process, this isn't what I thought love was, or this isn't what love looks to me. And so it makes that victim question everything they thought they knew to be true. Mm -hmm. Abusive relationships typically do not start as abusive. And so I, I, I know another story of a person who actually had begun working with a person and over the course of their working relationship, they became romantically involved. At one point, this person moved into the woman's home and became the, the stepfather or the father figure for her, her two children. And they had been in this relationship for quite some time before they decided, you know what, it's time to get married. And so they got married and he hit her the very first time the night of their honeymoon. And never before had he been physically abusive to her, never before. He hit her that first night. And then what that started was a 12 year relationship of physical, sexual, emotional abuse that in sitting in our support groups and having that conversation with her, that woman would say to me, I never saw that coming. Had I known that this element was going to exist in my relationship, clearly I would not have went ahead and said I do. But the tactics of emotional abuse are sometimes so very, very subtle that you wouldn't look at those things initially and call them emotional abuse. You know, I even think about... Um, teen dating relationships, let's say, you know, when you're in the very first process of trying to figure out what does a relationship look like and how are people supposed to behave? And I've seen lots of teen girls in relationships where all of a sudden they find, all of a sudden they find themselves with an abuser. And, you know, you'll go back through how have things progressed in your relationship and nine times out of 10, and, and especially in those young relationships, they start out as incredibly, um, controlling and jealous, where the person wants to spend all of their time with their victim. As a teenage girl, you're enamored with that. You think, oh, look how much she loves me. But then that turns into, you can't spend time with your family. You can't spend time with your friends. If you don't answer the phone when I call, where are you? And then that moves into adult relationships as well. And so the story that I just told you, there were elements of that emotional abuse going on the entire time. And so when that woman came to me and told me that story, that was one of the very first things I did is I said, okay, so that was the very first time you ever experienced physical abuse. Pull out the uh, abuse inventory checklist. Let's go through this. Have you experienced any of these other things? And then watch the awareness as that woman checked box after box after box, almost 100% on the emotional abuse side for certain. And so we've said in earlier programs, what we know to be true about domestic violence is it intensifies over time and in frequency and in severity. 
And so in those initial days, that abuser was able to maintain the level of power and control that he wanted to maintain through the verbal and the emotional. But then what he did the night of the wedding is, for lack of a better term, he sealed the deal. Now I have you, and now I can do with you whatever I want. Mm -hmm. When a person comes out of that scenario and the level of self-confidence and self-esteem is so lacking, of course it is. If you can't go to the grocery store and look at the food on the shelves and know what you like to eat, of course it is. You've been stripped of all of those things. Mm -hmm. The average person on the street doesn't consider that. Who thinks of these things? Yes. And so, you know, I'll tell you another story that really kind of outlines an abuser's intent when it comes to emotional abuse. Because the intent, again, to strip the self-confidence, to strip the self-worth, one of the ways that you do that is your crazy making behavior. And so there was a specific example of a woman who came to our support groups where her husband was so intent on convincing her that she was crazy. And so he had this very tactical plan completely spelled out that honestly, at the end of the whole thing, she came to us and said, I'm pretty sure that I'm crazy. And so then my question is, why do you think that? And so over time, like things like this would happen. She would come in, in the home. They had a, a table by the front door where they had like a bowl where everybody in the family threw their keys. She would come in the front door, throw her keys in the bowl and go about her business and do whatever. When it came time to leave to go somewhere, she'd go back to get her keys and her keys weren't there. So then she'd be like, where are my keys? And begin this search around the home. And always, every single time, her abuser would find them and would say, you are so stupid. You can't even keep track of your keys. How stupid can one person be? Then there was a, another scenario that would take place where after in the evenings after dinner was done, for example, there was a place on her, her couch where she liked to go and sit and she would read a book. She had a floor lamp next to her, her couch. She would pick up the book, sit on the couch, reach over, pull on the lamp and sit there and read. He went so far on one particular occasion. She came in the room, sat down, picked up the book, went to turn on the lamp, and the lamp wasn't there. And he was sitting in the room laughing like crazy, saying, you're an idiot. The lamp is on the other side of the couch. What are you doing? Those kind of things happened time and time and time again, where she truly did honestly question her sanity. She said, I, I honestly believe that I'm losing my mind. I don't know how I can't keep track of things. I don't know how all of these things keep happening. I don't know what's going on. And every single time he would be on hand to point at her, to laugh at her, and to prove to her how stupid she was. Now, I mean, you can't get much more tactical and much more purposeful than that. No. This threatens to harm your pet. And let me tell you, um, if you're an animal lover, which I know you are and which I know I am, an animal's a member of your family. You love that dog, you love that cat, maybe you love a hamster, like that's a member of your family. And so if you get to know a person well enough, you get to know that if I wanna hurt that person, this is how I can hurt that person. And so there are a lot of threats that are made in abusive relationships to animals that are in the home. And so I'm gonna get on a soapbox for a second real quick about that, because I do work in the shelter setting. And I know that there are still shelters today that will not allow victims of domestic violence to bring their pets into shelter. And I will tell you that in some scenarios, that makes the difference between someone being able to leave and someone actually staying in their abusive relationship because they do not want harm to come to their animal. And so I think I just need to get on the soapbox and put a plug out there. If, you're, if you know a shelter who's not allowing this to happen, there, there are options available for that shelter to make sure that people can come into the shelter setting with their pet, their pets. I know at the crisis center and the way that we're set up, you can bring whatever you want. I mean, we've had dogs, we've had cats, we've had iguanas, we've had birds. <laughs> we've had, short of not having a horse there and someone asked if they could bring a horse and I wasn't opposed to it, I just didn't have a place for it. Short of that kind of thing, it's so important. It's an extension of your family. And so again, if you know a person well enough, you know how to hurt that person. Mm -hmm. And you know, in my lifetime, when I've, with my animals, if you wanted to hurt me, hurt my dog, that would hurt me. 
Yeah. And so again, I just, I wanted to throw that out there before we, we finish this topic because it's so important that we become aware of that. Mm -hmm. When people start hearing those stories, it's very easy for people to say, well, if that happened to me, I would just leave. And so, you know, the emotional abuse is the last piece on the checklist that we're covering. And so I want to step back then and take a look at all of these abuses. You used the word beautifully in a conversation that we've had before, and that word was escape. Here's the thing. When you're in a relationship with someone who is motivated to maintain power and control over you, you leaving takes away the object of their power and control. So an abuser is going to do everything to do what they have to do to maintain that power and control. So if you take a look at the emotional abuse, the physical abuse, the sexual abuse, all of these things incorporate every day. One of those things is happening. Multiple things of those uh, scenarios are happening every single day to make literally make the victim feel like there is no escape, that there is no way out. And so, you know, one of those pieces of emotional abuse is saying, go ahead, you go tell somebody that this is what I'm doing. You know, there's that threat. You go ahead, go ahead and tell somebody. It's said in a threatening way, but then the answer is they're never gonna believe you because the public person and the private person are two different people. And so it's not easy just to say, well, okay, well, I'm gonna leave today. What I want our message to be when we talk about this is that women leave their abusers every single day. Every single day, a woman is leaving an abuser. But because a woman has had the ability to walk away from their abuser, that does not mean that the abuser has stopped being abusive. Nor does that mean that that abuser is willing to stop being abusive. And so you may be able to escape from the home environment where you're being held captive. That does not mean that your abuser is not going to hunt you down, chase you, find you. And again, when we talk about the intensity of how abuse increases in intensity over time, if that abuser was verbally, <clears throat> verbally abusive or emotionally abusive before, there's going to be a physical abuse that happens as the end result of that. And so we have to keep that in mind. You know, we're talking about people's lives, people fleeing for their lives. We have to pay attention to that. We've been able to give good examples of each type of abuse. I think that we've been able to share personal stories of people who have experienced those. And so I feel like what we've been able to do as we've gone through that is we've been able to lay a really good foundation for people to understand what is domestic violence, what does it look like, <clears throat> what, is, what is the definition of it, what should we be aware of, and if we're experiencing those things, what can we do next? And so I feel like maybe we can throw out some resources that you have like in the back of your book, maybe talk about those for a second. Okay. I love to talk about 211. You know, just like uh, 911 is a siren call for help, 211 is also a call for help. Drug and alcohol rehab, domestic abuse, counseling, and much more. And that's straight from 211. So we've also got the National Domestic Violence Hotline. I never could figure out how to memorize that number, but I finally figured it out. So it's 1-800, and then what is the next number under 800? 799, so that's the next set of numbers. And then SAFE, S-A-F-E, so that translates to 7233. So that's 1-800-799-SAFE thing about the National Domestic Violence Hotline, it does not matter where you are. If you're in Arkansas on vacation, but you live in Tennessee, if you called that number and said, I need, I, I know my resources in Tennessee, but I don't know my resources in Arkansas. If you called that number, the Domestic Violence Hotline will reroute that call to the local place right where you are right now, so you can get services right where you are right now. Oh, I love that. What a wonderful service that is. Right? See, now this is this is another good reason, another good example why I have you on this program. <laughs> because I would not have known that. I would wonder if that's the way it works. But see, mm -hmm. you've got all these years under your belt, so you knew. <laughs> that's awesome. There's also the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence. 
There is the National Center for Victims of Crime. That's 1-800-FYI-CALL. There is um, SaraiOvercomers.org, great website. There's Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network. That's www.rainn.org. Again. And the acronym for that, that actually spells out RAIN. And RAIN is exactly the same way. If you are a sexual violence survivor, if you call RAIN, RAIN will reroute the call to your local program. And so we've gotten at the crisis center, we've gotten several calls from RAIN who've rerouted our calls so we can deal with that, that sexual abuse survivor or sexual violence survivor in our local area. Oh, that is wonderful that. resource there as well. That's fantastic. Um, there's thevictimcenter.com. Do you know anything about that? No. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. I shouldn't have put you on the spot. <laughs> there are all sorts of books and uh, phone numbers and all sorts of other things back here. That's just a few. And we are out of time again. You know how that Can goes. Can I say something in two seconds? Yes, absolutely. The world that we live in today has made it super easy to reach out for resources. Honestly, if you have a cell phone that you don't even have to have a uh, wireless service, if you have data on your phone, you can Google and find out services and phone numbers for local programs in a, a snap. And so we need to take advantage of the technology that we have now and people can reach out and access those services right away. That's a good point. And you know, if you're afraid to do that, because um, you're afraid your abuser would find that you had looked that up on your phone, go next door or call your sister or call a friend or ask a coworker to do that, somebody that you trust. And that way it's on their phone, not on yours, but you can have that information. And one reason I love 211 is because although I have had a hard time memorizing 1-800-799-SAFE until just a few days ago, um, I know that even I could remember 211 because there again, they list on there that they are ready to help in an emergency. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, Becky, thank you so much again for being my co-host on this show. I hope my pleasure. you, <laughs> I just love having you on here. Folks, we look forward to talking to you again next time. Mm -hmm.